This is Fancy Can, and this is part two of the Unit 12 notes. Today we're going to talk about viral diseases. You may have thought you couldn't learn anything more about viral diseases, having heard as much about viruses in the last year as you have, but there are actually more things to learn about them. Uh, the picture here shows some uh, common uh, infections or things that you might have heard of before. Coronavirus, of course, is one of the types of viruses that causes colds. It's also the one that it's also the type of virus that causes uh, uh, COVID-19. But rhinovirus, uh, parainfluenza, adenovirus, those are all, and, and coronavirus are all types of viruses that can cause things like the common cold. Herpes virus um, causes various kinds of things. Um, you have a, ten I have a tendency to think about fever blisters or cold sores that you get around your mouth. There are other places you can get herpes, and there are other kinds of herpes viruses. Uh, for instance, the chickenpox virus is a type of herpes virus. Uh, hepatitis B is another one that's, a, that's an infectious uh, disease that's, that could be long-lasting. Uh, things that you don't see very often anymore that were common childhood diseases, childhood diseases when I was a kid back in the dark ages. Uh, mumps, measles, um, uh, chickenpox, things like that were re really common. Um, and now we have vaccines for those things, and so hardly anybody gets them anymore. I'm not. Uh, there are various other kinds of viruses. Some of these you may have heard of, and some that you may not have. Um, but the point is that you've got lots of different kinds of viral diseases. We're going to focus on a few of them, and spend more more time talking about emerging viruses, which is what we've been dealing with for the last year uh, with the coronavirus. So, uh, one this time of year, normally what you think about in terms of viral diseases is something like the flu, and so. This diagram uh, does a good job of showing you how uh, <clears throat> influenza affects uh, the respiratory tract. Basically, there are uh, various kinds of proteins, surface proteins, on the on the virus on the viral capsid. Uh, there's a neuraminidase protein and a hemagglutinin protein, and apparently, the way that the uh, flu uh, infection generally binds to respiratory tract cells is that hemagglutinin prone protein actually. Um, forms a bond or kind of fits together like a key in a lock with with sialic acid component of some of the glycoproteins or glycolipids on the uh, on the surface of the cell, and so that just kind of fits together and it and it basically it's an invitation to uh, to the uh, to cell to allow the virus to come in. And once the virus gets in, that's when it starts call it, causing all its problems, which caused all the symptoms of the flu, like is the fever and the body aches and the <clears throat> coughing and and the various um, various symptoms that you have when you have the flu. Uh, herpes virus is another common virus. This is again, this is the one that causes um, fever blisters, and there are various other conditions that are caused by various types of herpes viruses. Um, and this just is just a diagram. This actually was in your book um, that shows the herpes virus uh, attaching to cells. So how do viruses get transmitted? Again, we know a lot more about this now than we used to know, than you, you probably are more familiar with than you would have been um, this time last year. Um, there are viruses that are transmitted by sexual contact. They're also transmitted by contaminated blood or needles. You inhale some of them. Direct contact sometimes, uh, touching something, can, can transfer a virus to you. Various kinds of body fluids. Contaminated food or water can also, and you can also get viruses um, uh, by means of the bite of an infected animal. And so there's just some examples of ways that you can catch various viruses. We're very familiar with inhalation and direct contact because that's what we think about now as we're protecting ourselves from the, from the uh, coronavirus. So emerging viruses are ones that are that uh, come suddenly or that are new to the medical scientists, and, and though, oftentimes they are ones that make a jump from uh, various animals to humans. <clears throat> uh, sometimes they're just something that's in, been in an isolated population. And so we'll talk about a few of these and some details about them. Um, HIV, you've heard of, that's the, that's the virus that causes AIDS. The Ebola was in the news a few years ago with, a, with an Ebola outbreak that actually spread to, to beyond where you normally would find Ebola. West Nile virus is something that we actually have here in Bryan College Station. Uh, Zika virus uh, got the, in the news a couple of years ago when, when it caused problems with people uh, attending the uh, Olympics in, in Brazil. And of course, the, our old friend for the last year is the coronavirus, which, which is called SARS-CoV-2. 
<clears throat> so what, do you, what uh, are some things that contribute to viral diseases emerging? One thing is mutation. Uh, RNA viruses in particular mutate rapidly. There's not the normal um, spell check mechanism with RNA replication that you have with DNA replication. And so they mutate very easily, uh, very, very rapidly. Um, contact between species. There's, there are viruses from other animals that spread to humans, and several of the ones that we have um, seen in the last few years have been ones that have been uh, have made the jump from other animals to humans. And then also spread from isolated populations to larger populations, sometimes over great distances because people travel. So there are various uh, ways, and we'll talk about some of those as we go. So HIV causes the disease AIDS. AIDS is the acquired immuno, immunodeficiency syndrome, and it's caused by HIV, which is the human immunodeficiency virus. Okay, It's an RNA virus. It's actually a retrovirus. It has two copies of its RNA genome, and it also carries molecules of something called reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase basically takes the RNA and is used as a, use it as a template to produce DNA. It then takes over in the cell. So we'll look at some details about how that works. Okay, here's a diagram of the uh, HIV. There is an envelope <clears throat> with glycoproteins on the surface. The capsid on the inside is kind of a tetrahedral shape, basically. There are two identical strands of RNA of the viral of the viral RNA, and there are two copies of reverse transcriptase enzyme. And so when the RNA when the HIV uh, attaches to the cell, basically, it, uh, the reverse transcriptase makes uh, a single DNA strand from the RNA template, and then it also adds a complementary DNA strand, and then the DNA strand can get into the nucleus and integrate into the chromosome, become what we call a provirus, kind of like the prophage we talked about with, with bacteriophages, and then that provirus DNA is used to make messenger RNA which then can be translated to produce proteins, and then the new viral particles are put together, leave the host cell, and can infect other cells. One of the really bad things about HIV is that it actually, it's the cell of choice in humans is the T cell, which is one of our major uh, cells that helps fight infection. We'll talk about uh, in another week or so. So here's the kind of the stepwise how it happens. Here's the viral RNA. And we're making our DNA strand, and we'll make our, co our complementary DNA strand, which then incorporates into the nucleus. <clears throat> and then that is translated, transcribed into RNA, translated into the proteins. And then basically, the, um, this is an envelope virus, and the envelope uh, is oftentimes a part of the cell membrane of the host. And that's one reason it's recognized, because those, those glycoproteins there are actually, some of those are viral glycoproteins, and some of them are the cell glycoproteins, which means that it's easily recognized. Uh, HIV is not really a disease. It's called a syndrome, because it's basically, uh, it causes immune system failure, because it's, it's infecting mostly the helper T cells, which are kind of the... Um, the g battlefield generals of the of the immune system they kind of control everything and, and get everything started it is transmitted through sexual contact or through contaminated blood or needles contaminated body fluids of various kinds uh, the picture you see here is of an opportunistic infection that often happens as a re that's why people usually actually die from from a uh, from aids they don't really die from aids they die from opportunistic infections that that because their immune system can't fight them off so it's, it's really a, a failure of the immune system. Uh, in 2009, you guys were pretty little at the time, but, but there was, a, there was a, a type of flu that was a new flu. It was called the H1N1 flu virus. <coughs> Causes like flu does, uh, fever, chills, fatigue, cough, sore throats, all that kind of stuff. It's transmitted through inhalation. Uh, through droplet inhalation, basically. Uh, my daughter actually caught this and it had to end up dropping out of college that semester because she missed too much class because she was sick for a couple of weeks. Um, and so she ended up, we ended up having to withdraw her from school um, because she couldn't get caught up after having been out for a couple of weeks. So it was a pretty bad flu. Ebola also was in the news a few years ago. Ebola virus causes high fever, uncontrolled internal bleeding, immune system chaos, basically. There's a video that I'm going to show you. I'm going to post it separately because it's not really working very well to, um, 
to do that within the within the notes recording, but it's a, a really good uh, video about explaining how Ebola attacks the body, and it's transmitted through body fluids. One of the bad things about the Ebola outbreak is Ebola has been around actually for about 40 years or so, but um, but it was usually isolate in isolated villages. Uh, probably was an a, something from an ape that that got transmitted to humans. And it usually would burn through a village. Some people were able to survive it, <clears throat> and then, but the <clears throat> villages gen generally did not have much contact with each other, and so it would it would it didn't really spread very wide. But as pe as people moved into cities more uh, frequently, then it got to be able to be spread. And and uh, sometimes somebody that lived in the city would go home for the funeral of some of some of their loved ones um, in the village and get infected accidentally and then come back to the city and spread and that's kind of what happened with the with the outbreak in 2013 or 14 is that it is spread that way so it's pretty bad uh, video that we'll, we'll look at and I'll post it another virus is um, that we have here actually in College Station is called West Nile virus and it's spread by mosquitoes um, most of the time, people get infected. They don't even have any symptoms. They do, or they have very light symptoms. They may not realize it. Some people get a headache, fever, or headache. Some people have a very bad infection from it. Um, they get an encephalitis, which is infl inflammation or uh, infection of the brain, or the the linings around the brain and spinal cord can cause uh, paralysis confusion, seizures, all kinds of stuff like that. It's not transmitted through inhalation, really. It's transmitted through the bite of an, in, of an insect. Uh, Zika virus, <clears throat> another one that, it, that can be transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, it's been around for a good while, too, but back, back when there was a few years ago, when there was a bad outbreak of it, they found that, uh, that it, if a woman was pregnant when she got infected, uh, that could cause serious birth defects called microcephaly. And microcephaly is basically when the when the brain doesn't grow or the head doesn't grow enough for the brain, and so the um, there are all kinds of uh, problems with with uh, developmental disorders and things like that. And it's also transmitted transmitted through the bite of infected mosquitoes. The common cold, of course, most everybody has has colds of various kinds. There's not really a vaccine for the cold because there are a bunch of different viruses that can cause the cold, um, and they mutate really easily. And so, uh, by the time you came up with a vaccine for one, uh, that one wouldn't be around anymore, and you'd be infected by a different one. Um, sometimes they're they're more annoying than anything else. Usually, we not get very sick with them. Sometimes you get fever. Sometimes it usually gets congestion and a cough. Sometimes a little bit of achiness, um, and they're generally transmitted through inhalation. Uh, the droplet inhalation that we concern, we're concerned about now, as far as as well as direct contact. This is one that can stay active on the on surfaces for a while. So basically, you know, shaking hands, touching uh, doorknobs, that kind of stuff. It's very very common to have a, a cold. Some, a lot of times you get one a couple of times a year. Smallpox is something that we don't really see anymore. This has actually been uh, been eradicated in the wild. Um, when I was a kid, you used to have to have a smallpox vaccination before you could start school. It's pretty bad. It's it's um, you have these blisters or lesions all over you. Uh, high fever <clears throat> can it's often fatal. Uh, various kinds. It's in, transmitted through inhalation or direct contact. Um, and a lot of adults in my generation have have a scar on our arm from from the uh, in, from the vaccine because you had to basically. Uh, they had to puncture the skin like it shows over here with the with a needle and put some of the put some of the uh, infectious serum there to and it caused a blister that caused a scar and um, but it's been eradicated uh, you don't we haven't been giving um, smallpox vaccines in the United States since I want to say the uh, early 1970s um, and it's been eradicated uh, worldwide but that still exist in the freezers and places like CDC and places like that. And there are concerns that some rogue governments um, might, or rogue entities might want to try to weaponize it as a biological weapon. It's a pretty bad disease. There are other kinds of infectious particles or infectious agents that are similar to viruses in some ways, but they're not the whole thing. Uh, 
viroids are or viroids are small circular RNA molecules that can infect plants okay and basically they don't produce the proteins they do interfere with plant growth but they only infect plants. Another type of infectious agent is a prion or prion, and prions are infectious proteins that basically can cause degenerative brain diseases in animals. Uh, there's one that was that would, there was an outbreak in in uh, United Kingdom several years ago of something called mad cow disease, um, and it's it's a type of, it's a degenerative brain disease. Uh, prions appear to be misfolded forms of normal proteins. And then they convert normal proteins to misfolded forms. Um, it can it can infect humans. There are various ones that can infect humans. Uh, they're not real common, but they do happen every now and then. And um, they're just very different than viruses. And that will be the end of the notes on part two.